we gather in a sacred space, a place that is sacred to us because it forms a large part of the tapestry which is in the heart of our faith. Before we celebrate the Requiem Mass, delighted to welcome the speakers who will talk of footballer, the friend, and the family man. And it's only right that they do so because for so many, many, this church of St Mary's is where faith, football, and family meet. It's the birthplace of what we've come to know as the Celtic way of something that's more than just a club. But we're also here to pray with John's family and to remember also at the heart of our salvation today, there is a family. And we're here to pray earnestly for them too. But pray for your comforting. But there's the first speaker today needs no introduction to, by, um, to any of us here. I'm delighted to, to welcome forward fellow Ryan and a, a great long serving ambassador to Celtic and a friend to John. I'd like to welcome Jim Craig. Reverend Father, members of the Hughes family, ladies and gentlemen, I first met John Hughes at the age of 15 in 1958. I was playing for St Gerard's School in Govan. We entered the Scottish Cup for the first time that year and we got a home tie against a team called St Pat's Coat Bridge. Now, we boys from Govan, whose, most of whose families did not have a car, had no idea where Coat Bridge was, to be quite honest. When we asked our teacher where it was, we were told it was over that way somewhere, which wasn't really a great deal of help, to be quite honest. And on the day of the game, we were very keen to see what we were playing against, so we gathered round the bus which arrived at Perry Park in Govan to have a look at the opposition. We got a shock. This giant came off the bus, four or five inches taller than most of us, with a build to match. Once the game began, he took control of the play from the centre forward position and scored all of St Pat's goals in the 6-0 victory. Fortunately, I was a right back that day and used my intelligence to keep well out of the road while this big guy rampaged through the middle and scored all the goals. Seven years later, I joined him in Celtic Park where John, by then better known as Yogi Bear, was firmly established in the team. He was even bigger and stronger by then, yet most surprisingly for someone of that build, he had a superb first touch on the ball and a great ability to go past opponents using that touch and speed. The result was an excellent return of goals in matches, many of which were in crucial games. Even more remarkably, many of these goals were scored from the outside left position rather than the centre forward role. And all through these years, John Hughes was a real presence in the dressing room, getting on with everyone and contributing greatly to the excellent atmosphere amongst the squads of those years. 
These have been difficult times for Teresa, Kevin, Martin, John, Joanna, and the extended family, as they have lost a husband, father, father-in-law, grandfather, and great-grandfather. And we pray that they will be uh, receive the strength to deal with the pain of their loss. John Hughes was undoubtedly a Celtic great, but more importantly, a thoroughly nice man. May he now rest in peace. Good afternoon, everyone, family, friends, and fans of John Yogi Hughes. Uh, my name is Alec Gordon, and I am humbled and honored to be here today to deliver a few words on a genuine Celtic legend and a first-rate pal. I recall a day in August 2020 when John Hughes asked me to say a few words at his final farewell. We were having lunch at a Glasgow restaurant when he broached the subject his timing threw me just a tad. We hadn't been in each other's company for five months since getting back from a week's break in Millport just three days before the first COVID lockdown. Mary Gemmell, wife of Tommy, another famous Celtic player you may have heard of, had been in Millport too with Teresa, son Craig, and my Mrs Gerda. And Mary was there on the day Yogi pitched the idea at me to do his eulogy. Mary and I both looked at each other, had we heard right? I want you to make a speech at my funeral, repeated Yogi. I was reassured nothing was imminent. This wasn't the way I thought our reunion would go after five months of phone calls to keep in touch. Who's to know who's going to go first, John? I reasoned. As the afternoon wore on, the topic cropped up every now and again. Okay, I said eventually, I'll do yours if you do mine. It seemed a reasonable compromise, and here I am today, way, way too early in our personal handshake. I will never forget the evening I received an interesting call from Big Yogi. It was the middle of December 2013, and it was around 10 o'clock at night. Gerda and I had put off trying to erect the Christmas tree all day, but we decided to get it done before we went to bed. Anyway, I was balanced on a chair, wrapping the lights around the tree in my annual argument with a Nordic pine, and I was always also about to place the fairy on the top of the tree. The phone buzzed to life at that precise moment. After I had disentangled myself from miles of cable, I picked up the phone. I want you to write my book, came the voice on the other line, on the other end of the line. No preamble, just I want you to write my book. It was Yogi. And that phone call kicked off the most wonderful adventure that, alas, has now reached a premature conclusion. Writing a book is so, supposed to be a chore. You've got around 100,000 words to deliver to a publisher working to a strict deadline. And sometimes the words flow like concrete. Not in Yogi's case. Our meetings in the Burnside Hotel, once or twice a week, were something to look forward to. We both had our own businesses back then. So time was a little tight. We agreed midday to about 2 p.m. We'd get the job done. Fish suppers acted as blotting paper. Yogi picking up the tab one week and me the next. Very quickly, it became midday to 4 p.m. And we were having so much fun, it became midday to any time that suited us. When the book was done and dusted, we kept on meeting at various locations with Teresa and Gerda and Toe and sometimes Mary. 
marvellous memories, fabulous days, exceptional company. Somehow, Yogi and I had become fairly close friends. Please believe me when I tell you John Hughes was my dad's all-time favourite Celtic player. Uh, honest, I'm not likely to tell a fib in these surroundings, am I? My dad would take me to the dilapidated jungle at Celtic Park every home match from 1963 on, and my old man at the top of his voice would belt out that delightful little ditty, Feed the Bear, with thousands of others as Yogi in full flight set about demolishing the unfortunate opposition. My dad would never have believed that later in life his son did actually get the opportunity to feed the bear. I'm guessing you all have somewhere to be before Monday, so I won't dwell on Yogi's football career. It's all there for everyone to see. Yogi was a fairly easy-going guy, I think, but one thing did irk my big friend. He was not too fond of being labelled inconsistent, wonderful one week and woeful the next. Statistics certainly back him up. Yogi is currently the eighth highest goal scorer in Celtic history with 189 goals from 416 appearances. Even my faulty arithmetic tells me that is a goal almost every other game. And this tally was achieved by a player who played mainly on the wing, as Jim Craig pointed out. Inconsistency like that would probably make him worth around £100 million in today's transfer market. Plus, Jockstein regularly selected him for six years, including three years when Celtic were one of the top three or four clubs in the world. As I've said, it was a real treat writing Yogi's life story, and the memories just toppled over one another. Yogi, of course, was a scorer of some breathtaking, spectacular goals. He had amazing ball control for such a big guy. I once termed him a balletic juggernaut, and he said, that better be a compliment. I assured him it was. Yogi recalled a goal scored against the United at Tannadice on a winter's afternoon in a muddy pitch. I took a pass in my own half, looked around, and decided to go for it. I skipped past a few challenges, and I was aware of one of their players was hanging on to me, attempting to remove my shirt. I ignored him, kept on going, and gave the ball a dunt from just outside the box. Luckily, the ball flew into the top corner. I looked down, and there was the United player at my feet. I said to him, oh, are you still here? After the boots had been put away, Big Yogi, of course, went into the pub business. As we were putting the book together, I was absolutely fascinated by some of his tales in this arena. Honestly, a few of the yarns Yogi came up with made me think Basil Fawlty operated in a mundane profession in comparison. There was one little tale that seemed to highlight the new world Yogi now occupied. He had bought a pub in one of the less salubrious areas of our fair city. It had been bought sight unseen after Yogi and his accountant had looked at the books. It did a reasonable trade, it was up for sale at a fair price, and Yogi decided to purchase the establishment. On one of his first days, he was walking towards the pub when a television set dropped from the sky and, and landed on the pavement about six yards from him and exploded into smithereens. A bewildered Yogi look up, looked up and there was a guy looking down from a 10th floor window of a tower block. It's okay, mate, shouted the lad. Don't worry, it was knackered anyway. Yogi related the story and with a deadpan expression added, it could have been worse, Alec. It could have been the burst sofa. I was fortunate enough to spend three separate weeks uh, and a breaks with Yogi, Teresa Craig and Mary on Millport in recent years. And I will be eternally grateful for those days. One late afternoon in August, a couple of years ago, Yogi and I left a pub called Fraser's. The girls and Craig had gone ahead and it was just Yogi and I as we made our way back to our apartment. We took the coastal route. The Firth of Clyde was nudging the rocks, the sun in a bright blue sky was edging towards the hills of Arran, and Yogi stopped for a moment to appreciate the scenery. He looked at me, smiled and announced, I'm happy. It's only now upon reflection that those words convey such a heartwarming and significant message. Celtic legend, Celtic great, Celtic icon, Celtic man, 
good man. Here is a tale that underlines the true measure of an individual who was a giant of a man in every sense of the word. On Sunday, June 26th this year, Yogi was determined to say a final well, farewell to a mutual friend, a chap called Tom Smith, who had sadly passed away. Tom, who along with his brothers Jack and Gerard, ran the JSB bookmakers. Tom was a well-loved character and also regularly attended our lunchtime sessions dotted around Glasgow. The vigil mass for Tom was to be held at St Andrews Church in Bearsden at seven o'clock that June evening. Gerda and I arranged to pick up Yogi and make our way to the church. Yogi was resplendent as usual in his green Lisbon Lions blazer, but in all honesty, he did not look well. However, he was absolutely resolute. He was going to say goodbye to his friend of almost 60 years. Nothing or no one could have dissuaded Yogi from that mission. Clearly, he was struggling, and every step must have brought pain, but he wasn't going to let down his old mate. We parked in the car park, and there is a bit of a gradient leading you up to the front of the church. Yogi looked as though he was dragging an invisible horse behind him, but he was committed and unswerving in his quest that evening. He made it too. After an hour or so, Yogi was in our car and heading home. I realized I had just watched a truly remarkable and selfless act from an extraordinary human being. When we got back to his place, I walked him to the front door. It had to be done, I said. I said, Yogi, Tom was one of the best. 26 days later, John Hughes was admitted to hospital where he would pass away on August 1. I watched Big Yogi score the glory goals, play in the biggest games, enjoy cup final triumphs, and play his part in lifting Celtic from the doldrums of the early 60s to European conquerors. But nothing, and I mean nothing, will ever surpass his achievement that evening in June. Thank you for the cherished memories on and off the field, my old friend. And until we meet again, rest in peace, John Yogi Hughes. Good afternoon everyone, uh, I'm John, Dad's youngest son. Much of Dad's life has been well documented, so I wanted to tell you some stories, memories and recollections from our perspective as his children. Everyone here knows of Dad the player, and recency bias means we mainly remember Dad the old man, that's not what his children remember. We remember a giant of a man, fun-loving, terrifying, abrasive, generous, hilarious, soft-hearted but hard as nails with iron will, stubborn single-minded focus and gritty determination necessary in all those who make it to the top. He was a handsome, charismatic, fearless bear of a man and he was our idol, whose affection we sought out at every opportunity. Any positive interaction made us happy. He was also a contradiction, a flawed man. He was a victim of a harsh upbringing, yet still a great man upon whose coattails it was an honour and a privilege to be swept along. I always tried to make Dad laugh. It was the way we communicated. I liked to tell appalling jokes, so he'd roll his eyes and sigh and say, go on then, and he'd either laugh or respond in a way that's not repeatable in our current location, but for which I'm fairly sure he'd need to ask forgiveness. Um, I mentioned this as on reading Jim Craig's kind comments the other day in the paper. He spoke of how you were told to just get on with it back then, in an era of tough folk with minimal sympathy in all aspects of life. It reminded me of a family story when Dad was released from hospital after his serious injury, leg in a full cast with no flexibility, essentially a full length brick. So it was just Mum and a very young Kevin who had to get him, and they had a terrible job manoeuvring him into the back of a wee car. 
had to grasp the door frame and try and inch himself down the seat to nearly out the opposite window. And mum went round to pull on his legs. And at that point, Kevin decided, eh, that'll do, slammed the door shut on the hand that was holding the frame. Dad reacted as calmly as you'd expect. I was horrified to hear this and said to mum, did you take him back to the hospital? And she said, no, but I did wait until he stopped crying. So, as you say, Jim, little sympathy. When I asked Kevin, Martin and Joanna for their memories, I realised that we were all times when we had fun. Dad was a big kid. However, he couldn't tolerate losing in any forum, even when playing with his children. Kevin remembers playing with his friend on Space Hoppers and Dad joined in some play fighting. I'm not sure how Big Jock would have reacted to him being concussed by a Space Hopper to the side of the head. I think Space Hopper injuries were relatively rare, but he took a hefty blow and the bold pair retreated swiftly to the bathroom and locked themselves behind what was a solid door. They were sniggering and secure until the door came crashing in on the end of Dad's boot. He proceeded to run the bath and dump them both in it. Fun, of course, defeat, never. Joanna remembers him lying in wait to jump scare her coming in the door, which he always found hilarious. Almost as hilarious as she found it when he tried to squeeze into a Lamborghini for a test drive. Apparently the salesman was too scared to state the obvious, that he'd need to buy two and use them as roller skates. He was also a bit frustrated with Joanna when someone graffitied feed the bear on a family house he was building. Joanna knew nothing about football and Dad had to patiently explain to the terrified child, to the, to the terrified child that the house wasn't full of bears, just the one. He always enjoyed a good time, a room filling presence and the life and soul of the party. He'd sing at the drop of a hat and he went out of his way to find hats to drop. My memories are full of listening outside rooms when guests were over and of long car journeys and holidays, being lulled to sleep by his fantastic voice. He was some chanter, as they say. We found a birthday video of him singing My Way after inhaling helium. He was laughing so hard, we all could have been gathered here a long time ago. Helium enhanced or not, and whether on the pitch, the stage, or in life, he had great highs and great lows, but it was always his way. We really could have been here many years ago. Dad had very low odds of surviving his tongue cancer. Thankfully he did, but unfortunately, that was the beginning of the decline in his health. It was incredibly difficult for him to accept the terrible effects of that cancer, which stripped him of that great voice. As always though, he refused to be defeated, especially one memorable New Year's Eve. He was still in the midst of cancer treatment, couldn't eat, could barely raise a whisper, he was being fed by a pump directly attached to his stomach. In a moment of inspiration, inspired by desperation, he devised a plan to have a wee vodka to himself by firing it straight into his stomach pump. Martin and his wife Sheila, both doctors, were absolutely horrified by this and the idea was dismissed until they left the room and then Feather was pouring away. And when Martin found out he'd just pumped alcohol straight into his stomach, he said with a fair bit of annoyance, for the love of the wee man, Dad, I can just about understand the vodka, but why the Diet Coke as well? <laughs> so, in the interest of medical science, it's worth noting that alcohol pumped into the stomach has a remarkable lubricating effect on a throat ruined by radiotherapy. The old man managed to croak out a few of his old tunes. As his children, Dad was fundamental to our identity and was a massive part in how we saw our place in the world. There were many intangible and contradictory ways in which this could manifest. Feelings of confidence, pride, belonging, but sometimes inferiority. He cast a giant shadow, but for the most part, we were lucky to sit in the shade. Many of you will know of Dad's brothers, Billy and Pat. He loved them both and was fiercely loyal and protective of them. They both predeceased him and their losses affected him noticeably. Billy became something of a legend in his own right at Sunderland and Dad always admired his courage for leaving home at 15 and forging his own remarkable career. Pat's story wasn't as well known as he never quite reached those heights as a player for health reasons. Dad would tell everyone who'd listen that Pat was the best of them and of a time playing for St Mirren he apparently gave Big Billy a torrid afternoon. I expect that's true but the truth of the story didn't matter to me. It was the fact he was demanding equal respect for his wee brother that I found so touching. Their mother Mary and dad were teenage sweethearts who married young. <coughs> they had many happy years together, quickly producing a family of three boys, 
two normal and one devastatingly handsome, and a beautiful daughter. Long after they broke up, Dad remained close to our brothers and sisters. He was a man who was generous, gregarious, and good to know. He had more friends than I could possibly name, though I wish I could, as many were very close to him. He made a positive impact in the lives of many, leaving a lasting impression and treasured memories. He also left six grandchildren and a great-grandchild. He loved them all, and as you'd expect from any doting grander, was immensely proud of all their achievements, from the minor to the major. He was easily charmed by them. In fact, whenever they visited, the bank of Granda was emptied in a charmed robbery. You'll be able to spot a few of them fairly easily, I think. The bare DNA will remain powerful for a few generations yet. Later in life, Dad was fortunate to meet Teresa on holiday, and that holiday romance became a marriage that lasted over two decades. They had great times and continued to love their holidays together. Latterly, they found a place in Magaluf called the Mucky Duck. I think the attraction was that they were allowed to sing all day with friends who returned every year. They always enjoyed themselves, although, having Googled it now myself, it certainly wasn't because of the extremely sketchy area and the decor. They simply loved each other, and they loved each other's company. As Dad's health declined in later years, the burden of care fell on Teresa's family for many reasons. We owe a massive debt of gratitude to them all for their patience and kindness, particularly Linda, Maureen, Elaine and Diane. Dad was great at many things, but being a patient wasn't one of them. His career has already been addressed, and in fact Alex alluded to this next thing that annoyed him, which was being described as inconsistent. I look at it a different way. The way you look at it when you know the man, not just the player. Players in his position are the ones you look to for inspiration, for vision, for magic. You cannot create without risk. With each risk, each decision, comes a possibility of failure. But even as a very young man, you must have real courage and the ability to withstand and repel at times harsh and loud criticism from media, the stands and the streets. You must have a singular belief in yourself that you will get up, maybe fail again, but persist, fail better, until those moments come when the risk pay off and glory is at hand. Regardless, you continue to play the Celtic way as we have all enshrined it. Beautiful, imaginative, fast, powerful, skillful, and ultimately devastating football. You must have exceptional talent, incredible resilience, and the courage to continue creating. Dad had that. He created magic for the many, and he leaves a legend. As his family, <laughs> As his family and friends, we will remember those moments that are personal to us, or we were lucky to share with each other. We are also privileged and thankful that there are countless treasured memories for all of us here and in the Celtic community. It has been overwhelming, beautiful and comforting to see the scale of the response. Dad would have been so proud, as I know we are, to see the extent of the memories, the love and remembrance from countless thousands of kind and thoughtful supporters and many others. Finally, I just wanted to address the quote that I'm sure some of you or all of you have seen. He didn't want to be remembered for one goal or for one game. He just wanted it to be known he was a Celtic man. Perhaps to those who do not share Dad's love for the club, this seems to be a humble statement given all that he had achieved. Dad Bo was fully invested in the charity, the romance, the glory and the history of this club that infused his being. He understood that by doing the thing he loved for the club he loved and the fans he loved, he will be immortalised in song and story. For Dad, being remembered as a Celtic man was the greatest imaginable honour. He was dearly loved. He will be sorely missed. And he was a Celtic man until his last breath. Brothers and sisters, let us stand and raise our voices in prayer.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, so as to celebrate worthily these sacred mysteries. You are sent to heal the contrite of heart. Kyrie eleison. You came to call sinners. Christ eleison. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Kyrie And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who are mercy for sinners and the happiness of your saints, Give, we pray, to your servant John, for whom today we perform the fraternal offices of burial, a share with your chosen ones in the blessedness you give, so that on the day of resurrection, freed from the bonds of mortality, he may come before your face, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever. And ever. A reading from the second book of Maccabees. Judas, the leader of the Jews, took a collection from the people individually, amounting to nearly 2,000 drachma, and sent it to Jerusalem to have a sacrifice for sin offered, an altogether fine and noble action, in which he took full account of the resurrection. For if he had not expected the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Whereas, if he had in view the splendid recompense reserved for those who make a pious end, the thought was holy and devout. This was why he had this atonement sacrifice offered for the dead, so that they might be released from their sin. This is the word of the Lord.
A reading from the second letter of St Paul to the Corinthians. We know that when a tent we live in on earth is folded up, there is a house built by us for God, an everlasting home not made by human hands in the heavens. We are always full of confidence then when we remember that to live in the body means to be exiled from the Lord, going as we do by faith and not by sight. We are full of confidence, I say, and actually want to be exiled from the body and make our home with the Lord. Whether we are living in the body or exiled from it, we are intent on pleasing him. For all the truth about us will be brought out in the law court of Christ, and each of us will get what he deserves for the things he did in the body, good or bad. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still, and trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If there were not, I should have told you. I'm going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me so that where I am, you may be too. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord.
to carry on from my acknowledgement of John's family to Teresa, to his children and grandchildren, and great grandchildren to mourn a husband and a father, a grandfather. I'd like to also, in addition, acknowledge the presence of Celtic Football Club, Ian Banker and the members of the board, to the manager and team present, the Celtic greats here present of various generations. I'd also like to thank the contributors to the eulogy today. They don't necessarily make my job easier when you follow such eloquence, but it certainly makes my job briefer, you'll be glad to know. There are some time restraints in the internment, which is out in Monklands. You have to be there by a certain time, because you know, in Lanarkshire, nobody's sober on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> That'll be me in trouble with John Fallon again. With the exception of only seven years, I've spent all my life in Glasgow, in the East End, being brought up in Carmel, and then seven years in Rome, four years in Canton Hill, and then 21 years here in St Mary's. I was brought up in a certain generation where you were you to shout, feed the bear. I was talking about Roy Aitken. To which my mum in the corner of the sitting room where I lighted candle during the Celtic match would say, he's no the bear. John Hughes was the original and the first. The scripture tradition, or the tradition we have at Mass, Mass is like the living out of the road to Emmaus again. For Jesus on the road to me, he explains the scripture to the disciples and then they break the bread together and they understand what faith means. They see the resurrection. And we've gathered to listen to sacred scripture today. We've listened to words tell us that when the tent of our life is folded up, we gain an everlasting dwelling place in heaven. We've been prompted that there's many rooms in the Father's house as to the Father's house that we hope and pray that John is in today. For the Christian, death should not be an instance that stalks you all your days. But death is a happy friend who restores the joy of your youth. I think we're often so frightened about death because of the uncertainties and often because, as it is and was prefaced in this instance, often accompanied by old age and infirmity, and people often become shadows of their former self. And yet there is a beautiful prayer in the church that talks about God restoring the joy of our youth. We simply make our prayer today that John is at peace. We thank him for the myriad of different relationships he had, and as John said, how they were often contradictions, but what is sure is that John was loved. So in the simple prayers we say, go forth, Christian soul, in the name of God the Father who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ who died for you, and the Holy Spirit who is poured out for you. John, may your home be this day with Zion. May our blessed mother come to meet you with all the angels and take you to paradise. Eternal rest, grant unto him, O Lord. And let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. 
like to invite you to stand now and return with our prayers of intercession. Poor John, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints. Lord, hear us. For John, who shared in the body of Christ, to sustain him on his journey through life, that he may find eternal rest in the presence of Christ. Lord, hear us. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who have helped us, they may have the reward of their goodness. Lord, hear us. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face. Lord, hear us. For the family and friends of John, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord. Lord, hear us. For all of us gathered here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered again, together again in God's kingdom. Lord, hear us. Almighty God, our Father, be attentive and hear the prayers which we make. The prayers spoken aloud on behalf of our brother John, and those prayers which abide in the heart of each one gathered here. For we present them with simplicity of heart and sincerity through Christ our Lord.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be near, O Lord, we pray to your servant, on whose funeral day we offer you this sacrifice of conciliation. So that should any stain of sin have clung to him, or any human fault have affected him, it may by your loving gift be forgiven and wiped away through Christ our Lord. For the Lord be with you. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that though saddened by the certainty of dying, might be consoled by the bright promise of immortality to come. Indeed, fear faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, <coughs> with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Sun cheli terra, gloria tua, hosanna in excelsis, benedictus, qui venit in nomine domini, hosanna in excelsis. indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down the Spirit upon them, like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving you thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. in memory of me. Uh. 
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you felt us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one with the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, William, our Bishop, and all the clergy, Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co heirs to eternal life, and we praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Remember your servant, John, whom you have called from, the, from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with him, in a, united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. That we may praise you and glorify you through your son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Morning Star, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of all. Ah! Uh -huh. 
him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word of my soul shall be.
Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother John may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Before our final commendation, I'd like to just express a brief word of thank you to Michael Nicholson, who makes the resources of the club readily available to facilitate the parish celebrating quite an undertaking for a relatively small community here in McAlton. I'm grateful to the parishioners who support um, the, the life of the church. I'm grateful to them too. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother, John. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope that one day we will joyfully greet John again in the love of Christ which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Come to meet him, angels of the Lord. He is May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to Abraham's side. Give him eternal. And may your light shine on him forever. To you, O Lord, we commend the soul of John, your servant. In the sight of this world, he is now dead. In your sight, may he live forever. Forgive whatever sins he committed through human weakness. And in your goodness, grant him everlasting peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us take John to his place of rest. May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. <laughs>